So welcome everyone. Good to see good to see you all. Good to see everyone this morning. Um, welcome to uh, our Sunday morning uh, meditation class hosted by the Insight Meditation Community of Washington and the Center for Mindful Living, which is part of IMCW. And uh, I'm Hugh Byrne, and uh, I've, this is my I'm back after two weeks on the road. I was uh, teaching a retreat in Charlottesville and uh, the week before last and the last Sunday, last Sunday in Pennsylvania. Some of you, I think, were at the Pennsylvania retreat. And uh, thank you to uh, Afosu for teaching last week and to the Sangha led group uh, the week before. That was, I heard wonderful things. And so, uh, thank big, big, big uh, bow of gratitude um, to all involved and, and, uh, and Afosu as well for last week. So, um, I'm uh, the theme for, for today is tranquility, tranquility or calm. And so, I'm going to talk about that in a, a while. And uh, we'll, we're gonna, we'll begin as we, um, as we do, normally do with a meditation uh, about a 20 minute meditation. We'll have a talk. We'll have some uh, movement led by Emily, and then uh, and then um, some some time for sharing. Um, I think it'd be nice if we did some group sharing today, and then come back together and finish with a with a shorter meditation and uh, and a uh, and some announcements. So really good to see everyone. Glad glad we're together. Um, it's a it's continues to be a, a difficult time in the world and in the country and send our um, compassion and care to the pe people in in Buffalo as well as <clears throat> continued suffering in uh, in Ukraine and many other places in the world too um, which are not so publicized when you know, there's a major war going on in Europe, but um, keeping all of that in our in our minds and our hearts. And uh, you know, as I you know often come back to um, really the power of of these teachings of the Buddha and the practices for holding you know whatever life sends our way you know, individually or collectively, um, um, that we can develop, we can cultivate the, the skills and qualities of heart and mind to hold even the most difficult and challenging um, conditions. You know, we can cultivate the equanimity and the compassion and the loving kindness that allows us to do that. As the Buddha says, and I come back to quite often, you know, nothing can do us more harm than an untrained mind and nothing can do us more good than a trained mind not even your mother or your father can do you more good than a trained mind so what we do when we come together is is part of our practice of training our mind a lot of that is seeing the habits and patterns that take us away from from ourselves from being present, from being tranquil or calm, being focused, being here. Um, and that through training and through practice that we can um, live more fully in, 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 uh, in qualities like the seven qualities that I've been talking about, you know, in punctuated ways over the last few months, the seven factors of awakening and tranquility is one of those. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll say more about that when we, when I talk, but, um, you know, and at the heart of the practice is the, is meditation, um, as well as mindfulness in our, in our lives, but taking the time to, to pause, 
and bring awareness to to our experience and to see the ways in which we we escape from ourselves and we escape from our lives and we avoid avoid things and we want things we don't have um, it really helps to to be able to slow down pay attention you know kind calm the, the mind and the body in order to be able to move incline the mind in directions that lead to to greater freedom and happiness and well-being so we'll we'll sit and um, invite you to find a posture that's comfortable and relaxed Consciously take your seat <clears throat> and sitting in a way that's where there's a sense of relaxation, ease, also alertness. So you might find it helpful to let your attention come inward, letting the eyes close, or if you have them open, just have them kind of looking ahead of you a little bit with an unfocused gaze. You might begin by just doing a brief scan of your body and bring your attention to to any area where there might be some tension or some tightness. So moving down through the, the face and the head, notice around the forehead and the eyes, the jaw, the mouth. Can you relax those areas a little more, a little more? Coming down to the shoulders and the back of the neck. It's inviting those areas to relax. Those areas where we tend to hold a lot of tension. And then coming down into the, the chest and the belly, the torso. You might invite that whole area, the internal organs and the, the chest, just invite a, a softening, a relaxing. Coming into the arms and the hands. Letting them rest, the arms, the hands rest comfortably in your lap or on your knees or thighs. And then coming down to the lower body, relaxing the abdomen, the groin, the legs, the thighs and calves, the feet. Just letting go of any holding, any tension that might be present. Just inviting it to relax and soften. Taking a few longer, deeper breaths can also help us relax the body, the mind. Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind.
as you breathe out, you might consciously let go of any holding, any tension, any thoughts or worries or concerns you have. Just invite them to, to go with the out breath. Just letting them, letting them go. Inviting a smile has a, an effect of often of calming the body and the mind. And just consciously inviting the eyes and the corners of the eyes and the mouth to, to come into a smile. It sends a message that we can be at ease, that we don't have to be vigilant about anything. So inviting a sense of calm and ease. As you breathe in, you breathe out. And for this period of meditation, you might make a commitment to let go of the past and the future. Come back to them later if you need to. Let go too of things that may be happening somewhere else right now. Just letting them go can always choose to come back later and just commit to being present with your experience as it is right now. It's being here in a way that's relaxed and, the at, and at the same time alert. So inviting a sense of ease, of calm, accompanied by an awareness, not a tight awareness, but just relaxed awareness of your experience. You might let your awareness come to your breath, your breathing. Just feeling the sensations of breathing in and breathing out. You might bring a quality, <clears throat> a quality of interest to the breath, just feeling the sensations 
to be of the breath in the nostrils as you breathe in, in the chest and the belly as they expand and contract. Maybe taking in a, a sense of ease as you breathe out, letting go, calm, ease. When you find you're caught up in thinking, notice what takes you away or what has taken you away. You know, notice, was it a worry, a fear? Was it thinking about the past or something that's going to happen in the future? Was it a daydream? You know, just an image coming in or a memory. Just notice what habitually may take you away. And just choose to put that aside and to be here. Coming back with kindness and without judgment. Can this moment be a moment of calm, of tranquility? This moment just as it is.
a relaxed awareness of your breathing and just bringing the attention back when it when it goes off You could make thoughts the object of your attention. Just be being on the lookout for them, as it were. Not choosing to think thoughts, but just to bring your awareness to the thought process and just watch for their arising. See what happens when you just you know, like a, a frog waiting for it to catch an insect flying past. Just aware. You might find that the mind becomes more steady and more focused as you bring awareness to thinking rather than just being swept away in thoughts, you know, thoughts that come along, come out of previous conditions. Just be curious about what what you see, what you notice. share this reflection from <coughs> Arjun Brahm, a, uh, a monk and abbot in the uh, Arjun Chah's forest, Thai forest meditation tradition. He says, it would be marvelous if each one of us could abandon inner speech and abide in silent awareness of the present moment long enough to realize how delightful it is. Silence is so much more productive of wisdom and clarity than thinking. When you realize how much more enjoyable and valuable it is to be silent within, then silence becomes more attractive and important to you. Inner silence becomes what the mind inclines towards. The mind seeks out silence constantly to the point where it only th where it only thinks if it really has to only if there is some point to it since at this stage you have realized that most of your thinking is really pointless anyway 
that it gets you nowhere, only giving you many headaches. You gladly and easily spend much time in inner quiet. read um, Pablo, Pablo Neruda's poem in English, Keeping Quiet. Now we will count to twelve and we will all keep still. <clears throat> For once on the face of the earth, let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for one second and not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment without rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Fishermen in the cold sea would not harm whales and the man gathering salt would look at his hurt hands. Those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade doing nothing. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving and for once could do nothing, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth can teach us as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. Now I'll count up to 12 and you keep quiet and I will go. So if you joined us after the beginning, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. The uh, theme today is, um, is tranquility. So I want to talk for a little bit on calming the mind. The meditation, <clears throat> the meditation we just had was focused somewhat on on that calming of the mind so i want to talk about um tranquility calm um, and the role that it plays in the buddhist 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 teachings and buddhist practices you know how say something about its importance over over last few months i've been <clears throat> at different times <coughs> excuse me um teaching about the uh the buddha's buddha's teachings about the seven factors of awakening 
seven factors of awakening, these seven qualities that the Buddha says are really essential, um, crucial qualities to develop if we want to free ourselves from suffering. Um, I'll name them, they're um, and kind of in one understanding of them that one leads on to the next and on to the next. Um, you can practice them though in any way, you can focus on a particular quality of these seven. But the main thing is that they all become developed. We have the, we learn to have the facility to develop each of these states so that they, they, they kind of coexist in a balanced way at the same time. You know, if for example, I'll name them, um, invest, um, sorry, mindfulness is the first. And mindfulness plays a kind of balancing role between two sets of three. The first three after mindfulness are investigation, effort, and energy. And sorry, investigation, um, energy, and, um, and joy. And these three are called, um, they're qualities that are, um, kind of expansive qualities, they, they're energizing qualities that kind of the, the mind, the heart kind of expands and opens. Whereas the next set of three, the final set of three, are more kind of tamping things down, calming things down. So mindfulness kind of balances the, the energizing factors with the more um, calming factors, the stabilizing factors. So you have a good balance. So otherwise we would easily, we'd, our practice could be very, very energetic, but it could be too far in that direction. And likewise, without energy, the calm side might get too calm and, and become kind of sloth and torpor and kind of lacking in energy. So, so mindfulness, when we really pay attention, um, what naturally arises out of that awareness is the quality of interest, of curiosity, of being interested in our experience of like, oh, if I'm really bringing mindfulness to, to calm, for example, um, I'm, I'm, I'm aware, oh, I'm not feeling very calm. I'm feeling quite agitated now. And oh, notice that. Where's that coming from? Where am I feeling it? You know, that quality of being interested, being curious, investigating. And then when that deepens, it gives rise to energy. You know, energy, we, we, we feel energized because our interest, the more we become interested in something, the more it's like, oh, you know, whatever it is, you know, whether it's, you know, a painting or like, oh, wow look at those colors, look at, you know, and, and we kind of get pulled in and we become energized by it. And similarly, I think that how the expression is, um, where attention goes, energy flows, right? Where we put our attention, then that, that tends to kind of build up the energy. And the energy, when the energy is flowing, it tends to kind of manifest as joy. We feel kind of good and it often can be bubbly or rapturous or really, um, you know, joyful. Yeah, joyful. Um, so those are the, the, those are the, the three um, call them energizing factors. And then the, the last three are, are um, a tranquility, concentration and, equ and equanimity. And you can see those are kind of more calm, focus, balance, you know, it's kind of different from the energizing joy and energy and investigation. So what I want to look at today is this fifth one is this, it's tranquility. Remind you that the Buddha said about these, um, these uh, seven awakening factors to illustrate their importance. He says that um, just as the a river inclines towards the ocean. So these awakening factors incline towards liberation. So, and he has a number of different metaphors. He said, just as the, the rafters in a roof incline towards the top at the roof, so these, and these, uh, these awakening factors 
inclined towards liberation, towards freedom. He also said, an unwise dolt. Who's an unwise dolt? And the Buddha said, someone who doesn't practice the seven factors of awakening is an unwise dolt. He could be very clear speaking at times, the Buddha. He didn't, didn't when he pull his punches, you know. And he says, wise and alert. Who's wise and alert? And the, and the Buddha says, someone who practices, cultivates the seven factors of awakening is, is wise and alert. So our choice is, do we want to be wise and alert? Or do we want to be an unwise dolt? <laughs> So, um, in the, these factors, uh, these seven factors of awakening, and the seven, and the, this one I want to talk about today: uh, calming the mind, tranquility. You know, I kind of putting putting this, you know, the Buddha's framing of tranquility and the role it plays. Maybe good to say that in some traditions. <clears throat> calm or peace or a very highly concentrated mind <clears throat> these qualities are often seen in other traditions as the end in themselves like this is what we're going for or the a quality like bliss might be seen as the end of the you know the goal to be blissful or to be really really peaceful or really calm or really concentrated and the Buddha kind of took a different approach. <clears throat> he was very concerned with developing particular qualities. You know, much of his teachings are about cultivating qualities like the seven factors of awakening or the Brahma Viharas, the heart, heart qualities. You know, how important it is to cultivate compassion and loving kindness, joy, equanimity. Um, but for him, uh, for the Buddha, these qualities are supports or conditions that can lead to the goal, but aren't the goal in themselves. You know, the goal, the end of the path is freedom from suffering, freedom from greed, aversion, delusion. It's the deepest peace. It's, a, it's peace that is beyond all conditions. See, the problem with states like concentration and peace and calm is that they're very pleasant and they're very helpful but if we think that they're the goal of the practice or the goal of the path we're going to be disappointed why will we be disappointed well because they change they don't last they're conditioned states so if our goal in of the practice is to have a fully concentrated mind what happens when the mind becomes unconcentrated because something happens we get some bad news and we get shaken up by that if if the goal of the path is the concentrated mind fully concentrated mind or peace or calm um, then we're going to be unhappy when that state goes away and these states are always going to go away they're not none of them last forever they're conditioned states so what the buddha pointed to is a goal of the path which isn't any particular state it's freedom beyond conditions so it's freedom that isn't just isn't peace it manifests yes it manifests as you know the the when the, the end of suffering that the Buddha talked about, the ending of greed, aversion, delusion, will be experienced as the most beautiful peace. But it's not the peace that is, is the goal. You know, the, the goal is the end of suffering. The goal is, is the freedom that doesn't depend on any conditions. So the Buddha taught mindfulness as a practice that can help us to find freedom, whatever we're experiencing. You know, so bringing a kind, non-judging awareness. 
and seeing that we can't cling to anything as I or mine. So that, you know, when in our meditation practice, we see, can I welcome this state? And can I welcome this state? Can I welcome sadness? Can I at least not get into a fight with it? Can I be accepting of this is what's here right now, as well as peace or joy or more, you know, more, more pleasant states. So for the Buddha, the goal of, of the path is an unshakable freedom that doesn't depend on conditions. So why is calm, why is tranquility an important quality, um, one of these seven really essential qualities to cultivate? Well, the Buddha taught that a mind that is agitated can't see things clearly and can't, you know, be a part, really a path to freedom. By its very nature, when we're agitated, you know, we're swept up in a particular state or emotion and we're not really aware, you know, if we're caught up in anger, you know, it's the anger that's really pulling us along. If we're caught up in greed, like I've got to have this or craving, got to have this. What is it that we're being, you know, what is it that that is motivating us? What is the lens through which we're looking at our experience? Well, when we're caught up in craving, the lens that we're looking through is the lens of wanting. What's going to help me get the thing that I want? That's what we'll be focused on. If we're caught up in hatred, you know, our energy is going to be focused on the thing, that bad thing, that bad person that we don't like or don't want. And so we're not really going to see life and experience as it really is. We're going to be seeing it through the lens of the, you know, whatever that emotion it is that we're swept up in. You know, that story of the a person riding a horse galloping at top speed and somebody shouts out, where are you going? And the rider shouts back, don't ask me, ask the horse. You know, that the, the, when we're caught up in these states, it's the horse that's driving us along, the horse that's in control. And so we're not seeing things as that we're not really in control. We're not inclining our mind towards happiness towards freedom. So an image I, I have and I like is like if we wanted to look at if we were an astronomer and we wanted to look at the stars, you know, study the constellations and stars, etc. If we had a telescope that was moving back and forth like this and we're trying to look through it, you know, good luck with that one you know what we're going to see it's going to be what it's going to be blurred it's going to be unfocused it's going to be unclear in the same way if we're looking at our experience through any afflictive state then it will be the same kind of thing we're going to be looking through the lens of anger or we're looking through the lens of fear or greed or blame or judgment so calming the mind is really a way of stepping out of those afflictive states you know because it really is a binary thing if we can um if we're calm and at ease we can't at the same time be caught up in fear or anger or greed you know and if we're caught up in fear or anger or greed or other afflictive state, then we're not, the mind isn't going to be calm. So calming the mind is a way of um, helping us step out of the um, states of mind that are going to lead to unhappiness, that are going to lead to suffering. So calming the mind, you know, through just bringing awareness to our experience. You might just pause right now. 
and bring your attention to your experience and what you're noticing. Is this a moment of calm? Can it be a moment of calm, of tranquility? Just this moment, you don't have to be, it doesn't have to be every moment of the day or of the hour, but just this moment. So the more we cultivate calm and tranquility in, in, in these ways, in meditation and in daily life, we're able to see things more clearly. This is really one of the keys, key qualities and benefits of tranquility is we're able to see things more clearly. It's like, you know, the, the telescope or the microscope that's shaking around. You know, the more we slow it down, the better our picture is until it gets really, really calm and still. And then we can see wards oh, the star or whatever we're looking at through a microscope. You know, we can use that quality of attention. Calmness is really a sine qua non. It's a necessity. We're not going to be able to concentrate the mind unless we're calm. We're not going to be really able to focus the mind in a helpful way unless we've, we've, we've calmed it down, we've calmed the mind, we kind of, it's, and so we can see these, these three qualities of how calming the mind really creates the conditions for focusing it, you know, of turning our attention to what we need to pay attention to. Like, for example, focusing on, you know, is there, a, you know, a, is there any afflictive state that I'm caught up in right now? Is there suffering? Maybe on a subtle level, there may be something. There may be something, something we're believing, something we're seeing that is not really the way it is. You know, we're trying to hold on or grasp onto something. So we need to calm the mind. You know, the, the, um, and when the mind is calm, we're in, we're in a place to see what's helpful and what's not helpful. You know, that quote from Viktor Frankl where he says, between the stimulus and the response is a space. And in that space lies our ability to choose. And in our ability to choose lies our growth and our freedom. That if we can come into that space, space of awareness, space of slowing down, space of calm, then we can we can we can see things more clearly and particularly what we can see is we can see oh that what this isn't helpful to me but this is helpful to me you know pausing letting go of my anger towards somebody oh that that's helpful i feel more ease when i do that if i can just let go of that you know that person is so and so and they're this and they're that rather than fueling those that kind of agitation of the mind if we're if we're if we slow down enough we can say oh that doesn't actually help me it actually leads leads to contraction it leads to tightness it leads to it leads to suffering so then we can then we can choose okay I, i'm not going to fuel that anger or that judgment or blame when it comes up, I'm going to say, no, I'm going to go in another direction. I'm going to wish that person well. I'm going to send them some loving kindness. I'm going to send myself some compassion, some self-compassion or whatever that kind of inclines the mind in, a, in another direction that's, that leads to, to, to more happiness and, and greater freedom. That choosing to, to, to move our attention in that way, to incline our mind, in that way and that choosing the more helpful response leads to as as Viktor Frankl says leads to our growth and our freedom and the Buddha says leads to freedom from suffering so cultivating um, um, calm and tranquility um, is important in our daily lives. 
you know, just to see where we're caught up, where, where we get swept up in agitation or in fear, in stress, and to be able to say, okay, can I let go of that? Can I come back? Can I just pause, you know, find some calm for a, a moment, a few moments? And particularly in meditation, because in meditation, what what we're doing is we're giving ourselves really some extended period of time where we're dedicate, which we're dedicating really to paying attention to kind of seeing what's present. So we're, you know, we're being aware of our experience with the end of seeing where they're suffering and letting go, you know, through shining the spotlight of mindfulness and other qualities like calm that help us kind of settle and see things more clearly focusing you know concentrating the mind more being present calming then we see things more clearly we see the ways the mind goes off into the past and the future where we get caught up in reactivity or in mental proliferation and it's in this way that we can untangle ourselves from our narratives, from our reactions, by just coming back over and over again, coming back to the present. You know, I've talked quite a bit in, you know, in recent times about untangling the tangles, you know, the, how, how we get caught up how we get wrapped around the axle of, you know, in different ways of, you know, what are the ways that, you know, if any right now that life, your life might feel problematical. You know, hopefully, maybe for some, not, not at all. But for, for most of us, there'll be something that's kind of like an itch you know, Pema Chodron talks about it as an itch that we keep wanting to scratch, you know, that that something, you know, this should be different. My son should be doing this or my aging parent should be doing that, you know, they should be more compliant or my colleagues at work or my supervisor is this or that, you know, and so we get kind of hooked in these ways on how we think things should be. And and there's unhappiness in in that this is kind of the, like this this shouldn't be like this is there anything in your life right now where you're thinking to yourself this should be different it might even be this should be finishing by now okay notice that you know maybe i should notice that too yeah good point um you know whatever it is we could be it could be like okay this and it's what we're what we're cultivating is the awareness to see okay not to judge ourselves not to blame ourselves but just to see okay i'm really wanting something i'm really clinging here and and it's calm calm plays a very very important role in helping us helping us to see clearly we can see the qualities as well that it's important to to cultivate like the seven factors of awakening you know we might notice that we're out of balance you know we're we're you know getting bowled over by hearing some news you know something challenging come it comes along and it kind of knocks us off our feet as it were we say oh maybe i could cultivate equanimity um or, or some of you know the or, or one of the brahma viharas you know the the heart qualities you know particularly in relationships where we're judging or blaming or hating or whatever it might be we can cultivate compassion so i think the most important thing to say about why calm tranquility is important is that it is a factor it is as the buddha said it's a factor of awakening it's a it's a quality that can help us wake up you know by by calming the heart and the mind particularly calming the mind in this you know in, in terms of of being being at peace being contented being 
being present here and now. That we can, when we cultivate calm, as I said, we can see clearly and the more deeply we, that the more the tranquility deepens, the more the mind becomes unified. You know, this, this is somewhat more in the next quality of, of, of awakening, uh, the quality of, of concentration, samadhi, which isn't just about focus, but it's really about a, a real sensitivity of mind, you know, a real subtlety of attention that we're paying, paying attention to our experience. The calmer we get, the more the, 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 the mind tends to settle and to focus. And it can allow us to go ever more deeply into states of well-being, you know, states of absorption, um, becoming deeply absorbed in, in states of joy, of peace, of equanimity. Um, and again, these are, these are beautiful qualities um, you know, the Buddha had, you know, lots of um, similes to, to describe these qualities of it really being almost like, you know, drenched in happiness, in joy, in peace. It's like um, imbuing the whole of one's being, you know, the, these qualities. And they, one of the things that they do is they, they, help us you know they they really encourage us in a good way to keep practicing and keep meditating because they're beautiful states you know they're 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 states of deep joy deep happiness that we want to go back to sometimes people talk about you know well you can crave them yes you can crave anything um but um I, I remember Rob, Rob uh, Babea, the teacher I've been practicing with uh, um, his teachings for the last few years, has, um, his teacher, Arjun Jeff, Arjun Tanisaro, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, would say, you know, let yourself become attached to these beautiful states. You know, let yourself, you know, because you're getting attached, not in a way that's like craving, you know, in the regular sense, it, but you're really enjoying them. And if for a while there is a, you know, liking them a lot, then it's only in order to get to a deeper place of freedom, you know, so that the more these qualities deepen, the more we want to practice the more they create a sense of well-being in our lives more generally, in our life more generally, you know, so that whatever's going on in our life, we know that we can, we can, we have the potential to access these qualities. Rob Babea talks about them as an inner reservoir of well-being, an inner reservoir of well-being that we can go to, that we can reach to when when things are difficult, for example. But the most important thing of all, I think, is that the more we calm the mind and the more we stabilize it, the more it becomes a, you know, a kind of a launching pad for insight to look at things, because with a mind, just as calming the mind allows us to see things more clearly calming the mind more and more deeply and focusing the mind more deeply allows us, gives us a platform, if you like, from which to examine everything that's arising, particularly suffering in its, even in its very subtle forms and, and can allow us to let go. So the most important thing about these qualities, as with all of the other qualities, is that they incline towards freedom, they incline towards letting go, they incline towards nirvana, nibbana. Um, so, as the Buddha says, be wise and alert. Don't be the other thing. 
I'll just read a short, short thing from Gil Fronstal, um, who teaches out on the West Coast, wonderful teacher. He says, while tra tranquility is not the ultimate purpose of Buddhist meditation, it's an important part of the path to liberation, which is the ultimate purpose. Tranquility sets the stage for the final stages on the path to liberation. It's considered a factor of awakening that prepares the ground for deep concentration and equanimity. It also prepares the mind for liberation by doing some of the initial work of letting go. This is important, initial work of letting go, calming the mind. We can let go a little, as Arjun Chah says. Letting go of what keeps the mind agitated. Becoming tranquil by relaxing tension, quieting agitation, and letting go of discursive thinking is exercising the mind's capacity to release its attachments. When that capacity is mature, the mind can let go fully. The ultimate letting go comes with a profound sense of peace and happiness that is the greatest fruit of tranquility. So you see the, the point that the calmer, the more we calm, the more we learn to calm the mind, settle the mind, the more it becomes really a um, a lens through which we can explore our experience and let go more and more until we let go completely and and as Arjun Chah said um, experience the deepest freedom our struggle with the world will be at an end all our suffering comes from our struggle with the world struggle with the way we way things are struggle with with our life and the freedom is the ending of the struggle as trungpa chogam trungpa said there's no need to struggle to be free ending the struggle is itself freedom so i'll pause it here um, Emily will lead us in some meditation. We'll have some sharing and another meditation. So thank you for your kind attention. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Hugh. It's so uh, great to think about these things and my battery is about to go down. So I'm going to plug in. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me invite you to stand up. And just feel the soles of your feet and open up into the space around you. Feeling the air against your arms, your hands, the way your feet feel the floor. And then open up wide and lift your arms up. Exhale, soften your shoulders away from your ears, and then grasp your left wrist in your right hand and extend out towards the right, opening up that left side, inhaling into that left rib cage. Exhale, softening, allowing, and switch. Grasping the right wrist in the left hand, draw that right side over, extending out. Inhaling, softening, inhale up. Float your arms down and roll your shoulders independently. And roll them the other way. and come to center. Bring your arms back up, holding the elbows up. We're in cactus arms, drop those forearms and hands down. Inhale up, exhale lower, inhale rise, last time down. Inhale up, extend out, turn your left palm up and your right palm remains down. And on the inhale, switch over to the right palm, lift, turning, turning that up and switch back to the left. 
back to the right, to the left, and to the right, dropping your arms down, roll your shoulders together. Enjoying the mobility of these very important joints. Rolling them the other way. Now come to center. And we're going to come into a flat back. So place your hands above your knees, extending your spine away from your pelvis, even just allowing your hips a little bit beyond your heels. Breathing in here. Exhale, lower down as far as you would like. Allowing gravity to pull. Just gently pull you towards the floor. Only as much as you need today in this moment. Inhaling and exhaling, softening. And then bring your hands above your knees, soften them and roll up, stacking the vertebrae, lifting up your shoulders, drawing up by your ears, exhale down. And shake it out, just for a moment. Just have a dance. Bouncing, bounce, or be just having fun. All right. And turning your palms out, having your arms alongside of you, draw your hands above your head, palms together, draw them down to your heart, turning them out to the group, sending compassion, kindness, and love down to the earth, sending gratitude. And when you're ready on the exhale, bring your arms up overhead. Good. Now drawing them down to your heart, out to the crew, down to the earth, and whoosh. Good. Last time to the heart. And take a bow. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Lovely, lovely stretch, lovely movement. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Bob. Don't be an unwise dolt. <laughs> so um, what we'll do is um, I invite you to uh, think about for a moment um, what is it what is it that for you gets in the way of calm and tranquility you know remembering that calm and tranquility not so much as an end in themselves but but as a a path to to greater freedom in our lives the importance of that role that they play that tranquility plays calm plays um, what gets in the way for you, you know, when you look at it in your daily, uh, daily life, you know, what, what pulls you into agitation or anger or fear or worry and all of this? And, and in meditation, you know, do you notice anything coming up that tends to pull you away? And uh, does um, anyone have anything maybe we could take one or two folks um anything you'd like to share um you know any questions you have or anything that insights you might have any experiences you'd like to share um we got probably take time for a couple and then we'll have a meditation and some announcements to finish so just if there are anybody is anybody If I could, Hugh. Yes, please, Terry. Um, I was saying in the breakout that I had just heard about the um, shooting in Buffalo just before I joined you. Mm. 
mm-hmm. and how how it felt to just sit in that early meditation and realize that I control the emotion. I control whether I remain calm. I control whether I can feel compassion for the victims and the shooter. So the timing for me was really perfect, Hugh, to to be joining this morning. And yesterday I was at the Reproductive Rights uh, March in DC, and I've been marching (laughs) for this cause for 40 years. And I noticed yesterday I could just kind of be in the midst of it without maybe some of the resentment that I, I traditionally would feel. I could just be in it, but be myself and stand for what I stand for without getting pulled into a lot of the drama and pain of, you know, seeing hangers. I mean, there were many things that showed up yesterday that could have been triggers for me, but I think because of the work I've been doing with you, I mean, I've been taking Hugh's class on the heart practices as well as the Sangha. I just felt differently about how I could be present and not emotionally distracted, I guess. So I just wanted to share that with you, Hugh, and with with the group today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Terry. That's that that is, I mean, that's so much at the heart of the practice to to be able, as you said, to to be in the midst of something, but you know, in a way, be the calm and in, in the storm. You know, the eye of the storm. Um, and uh, and it's great to hear that. Great to hear your experience, and because it, what comes with it is a sense of of um well-being i think and confidence you know it's like oh i i can be with this in a different way it's not that you don't care or you care less than you did before but it's a it's a caring that doesn't have that kind of sticky quality to it that's how i experience it because i've done a lot of a lot of years of activism myself as well and and when I look back on it, I, I see how much, I mean, I look back with kindness, but I see how much I was caught up in, you know, it has to be this way, you know, there was a lot of clinging to outcomes and a fair amount of us and them, you know, the good people and the bad people, the right people and the wrong people. And, and you can have a discernment about what you feel is right but without turning others into you know into enemies i think that's what you're really speaking to so, yeah so thank you thank you for so much for sharing that and it's so good to hear because we're you know in a way it's the most important thing in the world right now is how do we solve these problems how do we solve the problems you know, and the Buddha would call it greed, hatred and delusion on a collective level, you know, where we turn whole communi- communities, whole countries into the other, and then we fight with each other and all of this. And these practices, and I don't mean in an exclusively Buddhist sense, but these practices of awareness and compassion, I think have to be part of how we work out our differences in society and in the world between countries and between people and between groups because without that i think we just keep the cycle going don't we you know we're right no they're wrong we're right you know and it just it just is this wonderful wonderful teaching of the buddha about these kids playing in the sand i don't mean if some of you may be familiar with it and they you know, they're building sand castles and, oh, my sand castle is better than yours and yours is terrible. And one kid kicks over another kid's kid's sand castle and then they all beat him up and kick him and, you know, and then they get back to building their sand castles. And then they realize it's time to go home and they knock all their sand castles down and they're no longer any important. And yet they've they've been you know, beating each other up about it all day. And it's, just, it's such a, a, a teaching, I think, of how how easily we get caught up in delusion and how with awareness and with insight and with kindness, we can kind of get off of that boat, you know, get off of that, that uh, treadmill or whatever the best metaphor is, you know, we don't have to keep on kind of recycling that, that stuff. So. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And I, I look forward to hearing how it goes in the future as well. You know, how that, 
continuing to kind of engage in that way. It's so important that we be engaged. So thank you. Any, um, maybe one more and then we'll have a meditation if there is anybody. We did have a few, uh, Jackie in Maine had a question. Okay. Jackie, Jackie, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Jackie. Um, I think something that I realized from today's teaching is that um, when I'm feeling joy, and that happens a lot when I come back to Maine, it's a beautiful season, it's a beautiful place, you know, I have lots of things to be grateful for and, and <clears throat> trying to really take it in and be in a joyful and, and uh, grateful place that um, my monkey mind, which goes all the damn time, um, seems to go away when I'm in that place. So I was, I was just, I mean, I, I, I'm just thinking about that right now. It could be that when I'm in the middle of worry, I'm not in monkey mind either, I'm just worrying. But it does seem that it's, it's a place of, of calmness and my mind really does want to be there. And um, if I stay there, uh, it's a respite and a, and a rest. Um, just thinking about that in terms of your teaching today. Yeah, lovely. <clears throat> and, you know, some of the, you know, as with all of these qualities, <clears throat> excuse me, there are supports for developing them, you know, some practices we can do or ways of engaging that can be supportive of, you know, that particular quality. So for calm, um, one of the things that is seen to be really valuable is hanging out with calm people. <laughs> that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you're going to, if you want to be calm, don't hang out with people that are, you know, beating each other up and screaming and shouting the odds all the time, you're going to get caught up in that, you know, it's just the nature of things. So if you can hang out, you know, spend time with people, um, you know, if you want to, cultivate wisdom, hang out with people who, who you think are wise, you know, who kind of like are thoughtful and balanced and all of these qualities. That's a big thing. The other is, you know, the Buddha talked a lot about, um, you know, seclusion, not not in a, sometimes we think of that as in a, in a kind of pejorative way, but seclusion in a good sense of just kind of putting aside things, you know, creating the clearing in the dense forest of our lives. and and being in nature is one of those ways that we can really really calm we can really find calm and deepen calm and uh so it sounds like you know for you that um that you know the being in maine and you know is 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 a conducive factor for for calming you know not maybe it's, it's not being caught up in the everyday stuff that you might be you know for the rest of your time i don't know um but definitely a wise thing to do is to is to spend time you know in nature take time to be quiet to meditate to sit all of these things are supportive of of calming the mind and then the calm mind is you know is um a, a really a a platform or a, a pathway or whatever the best word is for for freedom of the heart for for deepening deepening into into um, the freedom that's possible so thank you thank you jackie how long more do you have up there six months oh yeah lucky you Half time here, half time DC. Yeah. Okay. Very special. Great. So you're not quite a snowbird, are you? <laughs> <laughs> not quite. <laughs> you get snow in both places. But more, 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 more the further north you go, presumably. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you, Terry, for sharing. And um, we'll, we'll have a, just a short meditation to finish and then some announcements. So this will just be four or five minutes. <clears throat> so again, just 
taking some time to settle. It may be just saying the word silently to yourself, saying calm. It's a way, it can be a way of uh, inviting that quality into the body and the mind. There was Thich, Thich Nhat Hanh's kind of instruction, this is bre breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind. <clears throat> If we can cultivate calm in ourselves through meditation and in other ways, then we're more able, we can be the calm in the midst of the storm. You know, because we have that inner resource of calm and well being. Take some moments to appreciate you know, anything that you're taking from our time together today. You know, from the meditation or from the talk, from the sharing. Particularly anything that will encourage you to deepen your practice to incorporate it fully into, you know, more fully into the day, into your day, into your life. <clears throat> I'm going to finish with a, a poem. Um, and this may, may speak to those of a certain age. It's uh, For Forgetfulness by Billy Collins. The name of the author is the first to go, followed obediently by the title, the plot, the heartbreaking conclusion the entire novel, which suddenly becomes one you've never read, never even heard of. As if one by one, the memories you used to harbour decided to retire to the southern, southern hemisphere of the brain, to a little fishing village where there are no phones. Long ago, you kissed the names of the nine muses goodbye and watched the quadratic equation pack its bag. And even now, as you memorize the order of the planets, something else is slipping away. A state flower, perhaps. The address of an uncle. The capital of Paraguay. Whatever it is you're struggling to remember, it is not poised on the tip of your tongue, or even lurking in some obscure corner of your spleen. It's floated away down a dark mythological river, whose name begins with an L, as far as you can recall. Well on your own way to oblivion, where you will join those who have even forgotten how to swim and how to ride a bicycle. No wonder you rise in the middle of the night to look up the date of a famous battle in a book on war. No wonder the moon in the window seems to have drifted out of a love poem that you used to know by heart.